we have read the students' work, and it was a joy to read the diversity and the breadth of different approaches in our subject undertaken by people at third year undergraduate level. Stunning work. Everybody put forward who went to that committee was actually nominated by their universities as the best prehistory um, dissertation of that year. So in a way, we were dealing with the best of the best. It was quite a hard decision at times. And so we do have a number of runners up as well as the overall prize winner. In many respects, it would have been great to have awarded everybody a prize because there was such excellence there. So just as a matter of course, we're going to come up and do photo opportunities and everything. So the first runner-up best undergraduate dissertation prize is for David Anderson, Queen's University, Belfast. So a model for testing the connection between snake motifs in megalithic art and altered states of consciousness as part of prehistoric archaeology. If you want to come on up, David, and have your certificate, and Tess is going to be our photographer. Okay, so yes, if you come round this way, maybe. So first of all, many congratulations, and this is your certificate. And moving on, the next undergraduate dissertation prize runner-up is Kate Bridger from the University of Reading, who's here with Rob, I know is here. So Kate, would you like to come up and obtain your certificate and our warm congratulations? So the title is Not Just the Tip, Measuring the Resilience of Replica Microlithic Barbed Arrows from the Early and Late Scottish Mesolithic. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Supervisors? Yeah, yeah, Tess is in charge of all of the selfies. Well done. And our other runner-up for the best undergraduate dissertation prize is Christopher Hoyle, University of York, who looked at childhood conflict in the Central European Neolithic. So Christopher. Did you? Oh, right, okay. In which case, we are on to the winner. The best undergraduate dissertation prize went to Florrie Farkas from the University of Southampton on a topic of how can we use machine learning to identify hill forts in southwest Britain. So come on up, Florrie. Um. <laughs> we'll now move on to the slightly older um, category. This is for people who have done a lifetime, perhaps, of field work, who've not necessarily been part of the academic world, but have made their contribution elsewhere. It was set up in memory of Peter Clark, who spoke passionately at the last council meeting he attended about the value of the people who, in the words we've just expressed in council, produce the past day in, day out. So he also left open the idea that it could go to a fine specialist, and the nomination and the award winner here is Henrietta Quinnell, who as a field archeologist and ceramic specialist has worked diligently in the prehistory of Southwest Britain for decades with excavations and anal anal analyses changing ideas, collaborating easily with government, professional, voluntary, and higher education sectors and has brought to life the rich prehistory of the Southwest. Unfortunately, Henrietta cannot be with us this evening, but we hope to present her with this certificate at an occasion closer to home since she couldn't travel. 
So we will be doing that in the near future down in Devon. So the last presentation set of this particular evening is the winner of the President's Award. This is for people who've brought prehistory to new audiences, who've really pushed our subject forward and done so in really interesting ways. So I think it's fair to ask Dr. Jen Westler and also Dr. Neil Wilkin to come up together because this is a joint prize. We've got the scope to award one or two prizes for their work on the British Museum's exhibition, The World of Stonehenge and the accompanying book. The exhibition was a tour de force at a talking point amongst prehistorians and the general public alike. It showed the richly textured archaeological evidence of societies from unfamiliar periods and opened people's eyes to the idea of prehistory. The exhibition was an outstanding milestone event which has brought prehistory to new audiences. Thank you so much. This is also an occasion where we've had sort of some very senior people, we've had some junior people, we've had prehistory writ large objects, we've had different things from artificial intelligence to Mesolithic bones to whatever, lots of different aspects to our subject. And today we're going to welcome as the 23rd Sarah Champion lecturer, Dr. Adele Bricking, who's now going to talk to us. There won't be questions because immediately afterwards we have to go and drink wine instead. And so your chance to ask any questions you would like to comes with wine attached in the room just opposite. So without any more fuss, I'd like to invite Dr. Adele Bricking to come and enlighten us and enjoy the moment because you two in a way are our prize winners. Oh, thank you very so much. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I got my laptop. Okie dokie. Nice. Sorry, I'm just putting my um, slide notes up because otherwise I will go in many different directions and we'll be here all night. <laughs> um, Oh, let me grab my water too. <sighs> nice. Oh my gosh. Okay, hello. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, my name is Adele. Um, uh, first, I just want to say what an incredible honor um, it is to be here on this lovely, rainy uh, October day celebrating the life of Sarah Champion and um, the accomplishments of all of uh, the students and researchers who received awards today. Um, it really is really inspiring to see all this amazing research that's coming up, um, and it's really lovely to see all of your hard work being recognized. Uh, so congratulations again, um, all of you. I really look forward to chatting more about uh, your work at the pub uh, or the wine reception later um, and learning a bit more about your projects. Um, so just to manage some expectations, this is the first time I am uh, presenting my PhD research and I am quite nervous, um, so if everyone could just like laugh at all my really bad jokes, um, I'd, <laughs> I'd really appreciate it. Um, uh, I only just officially finished my PhD in January this year, uh, and although it was an unruly monster at times, um, I'm really excited to share it uh, today. So thanks so much for being here, and um, those of you watching online as well, um, thank you very much for 
um, letting me do this. Um, it's a massive honor. And uh, oh, I know it probably goes without saying, but there will be um, some images of archaeological um, and some modern human remains in this presentation. So without further ado, mortuary practices in the Iron Age of Southwest Britain. Um, there we go. Yes, so first I'll give some background into the wacky and wonderful world of Iron Age burial and all of the complexities that make it both uh, infinitely frustrating and infinitely fascinating to study. Uh, so the big thing is there's a, a notable lack of burial evidence compared to what the population would have been in Britain between the years 800 BC to AD 43. Um, we have huge fabulous settlements all over but very few of them actually have any kind of what could be considered a formal cemetery or a known funerary practice that can be attributed to those settlements. Um, of course, there are some localized traditions that we do know of, like uh, the richly furnished cremations in the southeast, there are Durotrigan cemeteries in modern Dorset, there's the southwest Pist tradition in Cornwall, um, there's also the Arras burials in York, uh, some of which include chariot burials, which is a very localized tradition, it's kind of focused in this area, um, but as some of you may have heard, um, in 2018, a chariot burial was actually uh, discovered in Pembrokeshire, way over here in southwest Wales. Um, and what's really interesting is that this burial actually post-dates the uh, burials in York by a couple hundred years. Um, so it's kind of around the time of the Roman invasion. Um, so it may be a completely discrete tradition that we're only just sort of discovering in Wales, or it may be that um, they were kind of going back to the old ways of doing things as a response to the encroaching Roman influence. Um, this is still the subject of uh, ongoing research by my colleagues at Amgyeth Vakamri, but uh, um, it is rather exciting to think that there may be like a whole um, tradition of later chariot burials in Wales. Uh, but again, these uh, traditions are quite localized and in some cases they're restricted to a relatively, uh, relatively brief chronological period. Um, sorry, technical difficulty. Um, okay. So aside from the few formal cemeteries, one of the most common places to find burials in southern Britain um, is within grain storage pits, or pit burials as they're called, within settlements. Um, so these are burials within disused storage pits, uh, and I want to kind of talk about how these pits work as grain storage because I just kind of recently learned this, and I think it's just like amazing and potentially really significant to why they're used as a container for human remains. Um, so as shown in uh, this photo here, um, this is a, a, an experimental pit that was made, uh, dug at um, Butsuri Ancient Farm. Um, so there are cylindrical pits that are dug right into the ground and they'd be filled with grain that would, um, you'd, they'd need to store over the winter. And you might think that like the wet ground is not the best place to store grain that you need to save until spring uh, when you need to plant it again. But it's actually pretty genius how it works. I mean, I think so. Uh, so <laughs> they'd fill it with grain and then they'd seal the top of it so that it creates like an airtight um, environment. And then What's wild is the grain that comes into contact with the soil actually germinates and sprouts, which kind of sucks all the oxygen out of the pit and it makes it like an airtight um, vacuum until the pit is opened again. And um, the spent grain on the edges can be discarded and then the bulk of the grain can be uh, used to secure the next harvest. So when we say pit burials, um, they typically refer to these storage pits that were decommissioned for some reason. So it may be because um, one of them failed and the grain inside was ruined or maybe some other socially controlled region, uh, reason. Um, but burials in them are often complete articulated inhumations that seem to have been you know, placed in the grave and then left pretty much undisturbed. Um, but it's not uncommon to find disarticulated bones and fragments of bones and partially articulated body parts like this foot here. Um, that was in the uh, backfill of a pit of a completely separate individual from Battlesbury Bull in Wiltshire. Uh, right, so similarly, similarly to pits, uh, Iron Age burials are also found in boundary ditches and um, the, one, the boundary ditches that enclose kind of the settlement area. Uh, so here is an example of a, as an elderly female that was interred within the boundary ditch at Badgenden in Gloucestershire. And then um, at Ham Hill in Somerset, there are several varied and pretty confusing deposits of human remains, um, including 
uh, isolated bone and partially articulated body parts, um, like a skull with a few articulated vertebrae and ribs. Um, and this evidence has historically been thought to represent the display of severed human heads outside of the hill fort, like on the ramparts or you know, the like war trophies. Um, but as shown in these two examples here, um, it's not always simply skulls. There's definitely a bit more to it than that. Um, and it's not just ditches and pits either. There have been Iron Age burials and bones and pieces of people from pretty much any kind of hole in the ground, um, post holes, roundhouse gullies, roundhouse floors, under ramparts, under gates, quarries, caves, wallets, water holes, tree throws. They can be everywhere um, and nowhere. <laughs> Because even with all of this evidence considered, it still doesn't really add up to anything that might be considered a majority right um, or a way in which most people are being treated um, after death. Uh, so this has led to the suggestion that most people in the Iron Age were given an archaeologically invisible uh, funerary rite or um, were treated in such a way that their remains never entered the archaeological record. So for example, excarnation has kind of been the most popular explanation for um, the overall lack of human remains evidence and um, the frequency of disarticulated bone and body parts found around settlement sites. Um, excarnation in this sense means that uh, basically exposure of the body to the elements where the soft tissue would um, decay quickly or be stripped away from the skeleton quickly by scavenging animals and insects, um, and then the bones may be uh, collected and maybe some may be redeposited. And there is some ethnographic evidence of excarnation in modern populations. So pictured here um, are some images from a sky burial in Tibet where corpses are brought to this designated location in the mountains and they're processed so that the vault kind of facilitates easier um, access for the vultures so that they can consume the flesh and then conceptually carry the person away into the heavens. Um, but if excarnation was the most common method of corpse disposal, then we would expect there to be some taphonomic evidence um, of the disarticulated bones, such as weathering, animal gnawing, cut marks, fracturing, trampling, abrasion, um, things that would suggest you know, that they have kind of been kicking around or um, chewed on. There are definitely, there is some instances of possible evidence for this, um, as we'll see in a little bit, but it really isn't super common. Um, a lot of the disarticulated bone that uh, has been excavated shows no evidence for having been exposed at all. Uh, so it's also really important to understand that the geology of the Southwest is especially diverse, um, which means that there's kind of an uh, inevitable balance, or imbalance rather, of human remains preservation. So uh, human remains preserve really well in areas where there's a lot of chalk and limestone, but they don't preserve very well in areas of sandstone and mudstone. So in addition to the possibility of invisible burial rites, uh, we're also contending with the very hostile burial environment throughout much of the Southwest. Um, so there's always going to be kind of a bias towards um, the uh, West Sixty, Chalky West Sixty area uh, than anywhere else in the Southwest really. Um, but I think that this diversity is super interesting uh, and it may even lend itself to some differences in culturally prescribed um, mortuary practices. So, to try and make sense of all this variation of mystery, we needed to pull together all of the data and detail that I could find about Iron Age burial in the Southwest. Um, there's been a lot of new sites and evidence that has been discovered since the last really big inventory was created, so um, we needed to kind of make an updated inventory for the Southwest and get a better lay of the land. Um, so I cataloged all of the characteristics of every single burial and human remains deposit that I could find. Um, so now I'm going to show you some of the things that we learned through doing some of the frequency analyses on uh, some of these characteristics. I'm mainly going to show the highlights because we don't really have, uh, well, it would take probably 10 years to get into the, well, it took me exactly six <laughs> to get into the nitty gritty details. Um, but this will hopefully give you a better picture of uh, Iron Age burial in the Southwest. Uh, so for the analysis of the burial characteristics, I'm going to primarily focus on the deposit type. So by that I mean whether the body or deposit was articulated, partially articulated, disarticulated, or cremated, because I think the different states of articulation might represent uh, different stages of a mortuary practice. 
And it might mean that somehow um, bodies, body parts, or single bones are kind of being moved around. Um, but the big question is how. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later when we get into the science-y bioarchaeology part. Um, but first, we'll have a look at the kind of spatial distribution of the burial evidence. Um, we'll also take, we'll, we'll take a look at the types of features um, the burials and deposits are placed in. As we talked about before, they can come from pretty much any context, anywhere uh, in the Iron Age. And uh, we'll look at details such as age and sex, the position of the bodies, like whether they were crouched up tight or lying straight, whether they were on their left side or right side, um, which cardinal direction they were oriented. And these sorts of details are not often recorded um, or at least reliably attributed in many of the kind of earlier site reports. But I did record this information uh, as much as possible, so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. And then chronology is a little bit tricky because, um, as many of you will <laughs> well know, uh, there's a um, uh, and have had to contend with yourselves. The there's the Hallstatt plateau, so that's a really annoying um, calibration curve uh, in radiocarbon dates that affect the early and middle Iron Age, especially. So it means that. Some of the radiocarbon dates on human remains that fall within this kind of range can be, well, they can't be accurately dated because they produce a range of several hundred years. Um, but whenever I could, I did record some of the, I, I did record the chronology of each deposit to see if we can kind of see any, or start to see any patterns related to uh, phase in the Iron Age. So jumping right into the chart apocalypse, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> These, um, these graphs represent the overall burial data. So as shown in, in this graph, uh, articulated burials are the most um, uh, frequent with 729 individual burials represented, uh, which is kind of expected considering the large inhumation cemeteries and just the general likelihood of this kind of evidence that would be recognized and recovered. Um, but look up, there's a whole lot of disarticulated deposits as well. There's 554, so I don't know. That's, um, I, that's and that, well, that's just what's been successfully recovered as well. Uh, it's quite likely that um, the figure is much higher, uh, but single bones just aren't um, uh, as easily recognizable or perhaps don't preserve as well. Um, there have been instances I know of, you know, animal bones that get. Uh, well, they're, they're human bones, but they get incorrectly identified as animal bones and so on. Um, and by comparison, the partially articulated deposits are not nearly as common, with only 58 across the southwest. It's still, I think that's kind of quite a lot, considering they're so, un, you know, so unusual, just having like a body part. Um, and then there's 21 cremations as well. Um, I was a bit surprised that pits are the most common feature that human remains have been recovered from, with 342 deposits. Uh, again, this is including articulated, disarticulated, and partially articulated deposits. Um, but that's quite a lot of deposits within storage pits. Graves are closely behind with 326, and I want to just start by saying there are a lot of like cemeteries, I'm sure as many of you will know, that were excavated by the antiquarians or earlier that um, we can't really quantify them because they would just say like many graves from this site uh, were excavated and then everything was trekked into the ocean, so we don't have numbers for that. but. Um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of highlight that there are quite a lot of, um, of deposits and burials within storage pits. Um, and then we've got human remains from uh, boundary ditches, kists, and middens. They kind of have like a more modest representation. But then you can see the whole other bunch of um, other places that human remains have been recovered from in far fewer number. Uh, of the burials where sex is determined, males and females are pretty much bang even. Um, there's slightly more females. Um, uh, and, you know, as expected, the majority of them are adults because the bones are more likely to survive, but this may also be down to some differences in post-mortem treatments as well. Um, there are all types of deposits represented throughout all phases of the Iron Age, which I thought was quite interesting, um, but there are some higher concentrations. So the majority of cremations have been dated to the Middle Iron Age, uh, disarticulated remains may be slightly higher um, in frequency in the early Iron Age, but they're surprisingly well represented in the middle and late Iron Age as well. Um, very few partially articulated deposits come from the early Iron Age compared to the middle and late Iron Age, and uh, as expected, most of the articulated burials do date to the late Iron Age uh, when formal cemeteries become more common. Um, 
So just some quick, quick observations about the distribution of the um, more highly represented features. So burials and storage pits uh, are most common in Dorset, Wiltshire, and Somerset, with a few in Gloucestershire and South Wales, um, and only a few from um, Devon and Cornwall each. Uh, a similar kind of pattern is um, in boundary ditches, and you know they're slightly more common in Wiltshire than Dorset, um, and so far none have come from Devon and Cornwall that I know of anyway. Happy to be wrong, though. Please grab me afterwards if you know of some. That'd be amazing. Um, and uh, we, as expected, graves are mostly in Dorset because of the large Dura Treach and cemeteries. And um, kissed graves are more mostly in Cornwall, though there's quite a few in South Wales as well, and um, a couple uh, from each sub-region, except there's none in Wiltshire. Um, and finally, the deposits from the Middens uh, are mostly in Wiltshire. These are from the Vale of Pusey, so mostly Potter and East Chisenbury, um, the big famous Feast Middens. But there's also a Feast Midden in the Vale of Glamorgan in South Wales, where at least 15 human remains deposits were recovered from the small, very small area that the midden, of the Midden that was actually excavated. So this is quite interesting, I think, um, a tradition of kind of burying people or pieces of people within uh, Feast Middens. Um, so looking specifically at articulated inhumations, you can see that there are concentrations um, in the Dorset area and down here in Cornwall. Again, these are uh, areas where the big, in, the big inhumation cemeteries come from. So we talked about the Dirtree Gym Burial Tradition Dorset, Southwest Kiss in Cornwall, and the Isles of Scilly. But there are large Kiss cemeteries. Um, well, these are, there's over 100 inhumations here uh, in, these, in, in um, Cornwall and Scilly, um, especially Harlan Bay. And we also have some pockets of inhumations along the coastline. Uh, we also have pockets along, or we have, um, there's some throughout Somerset and kind of like the West Sixty area. Um, and there is quite a lot of variety in these inhumations, especially in the feature types. Uh, the most common physical, like crouch position for these, uh, obviously this is kind of the typical um, Iron Age burial is the, in a sort of crouch fetal position. Um, and there's a surprisingly even number of burials that are placed on their left and right sides. Uh, but if you look at this graph, I think it's quite interesting in uh, this one here. Oh, gosh. Abort. Um, in this graph, um, there's, uh, there's more burials that are placed on the right side in, um, uh, where, where, where was it? Sorry, my computer's gone blank. There's more um, burials in Dorset are more commonly placed on the right side compared to pretty much everywhere else except for Somerset, uh, where the data is a little bit weak anyway. Um, burial on the left side is more common in the Southwest Peninsula, Gloucestershire, and slightly more common in Wiltshire. Um, so most of the articulated inhumations were adults, which isn't really surprising because adult skeletons are larger and more likely to preserve. Um, they're more recognizable as human, as I said, and may have been treated in a way that's more readily recovered for, um, from archeological excavation. And, uh, but I do think it's kind of interesting that there are more infants and neonates than there are adolescents and juveniles. You know, some of this will be down to inconsistencies in how site reports label the different age groups. Um, but anyway, there's a relatively even number of males to females with slightly more female skeletons identified at 53% compared to 47% males. And they come from kind of rel relatively even um, distribution of features. So I just wanted to show these because I thought it was kind of interesting how kissed graves are kind of like a coastal thing, whereas pits are very much more Wessexy Dorsity um, and kind of more of an inland phenomenon. Um, kiss seem to be quite distinctively where pits are not, with some exceptions um, in Somerset. And we will talk a little bit more about kiss and pits later on. Let's take a thing. Um, so this is there's a really interesting pattern in the orientation of articulated inhumations or um, normal burials. So as you can see in Cornwall and Scilly, there's a really strong tradition of burying people with their heads to the north and their feet to the south. And this is kind of the case in almost all of the burials, um, especially in the big kiss cemeteries. Uh, the north-south orientation is also really strong in South Wales and in Gloucestershire and even in Somerset. Uh, but the further east you go, um, the more orientation seems to vary. And this could be because there's different influences in Wiltshire and Dorset that aren't present in the coastal Southwest. Uh, or it may suggest that there's kind of a wider cultural tradition in the coastal Southwest that isn't adhered to as strongly 
um, by Iron Age groups in Wiltshire and Dorset. Um, we already know, of course, you know the um, the the, well, the, dis, the Deuteregion has the Deuteregion um, tradition in Dorset is quite distinct. So this kind of just expands on that a bit. Um, so there are also some cremations in the southwest, which I was kind of surprised by. It's nothing like the cremations in the southeast, um, but there are quite a few, so 21 de um, deposits total. And there's an interesting trend in like South Wales and Devon where cremations are actually placed in tree throws or hollows. Uh, and this is a common thing in the Bronze Age, but um, there have been some that had organic, associated organic material that were definitely radiocarbon dated to the Iron Age which I thought was really interesting because this is probably like a continued or enduring tradition. Um, overall, although they're few, they kind of span the Iron Age, so we've got some in the early, middle, and late. And of those that can be sexed, uh, both males and females are evenly represented. Um, adults are, uh, uh, again, more commonly represented, but there are some infants and juveniles um, found in cremated deposits. And you know, I think it is definitely worth considering that there are probably more cremations in the Southwest, but have either been assumed to be Bronze Age or were deposited in places that um, haven't been recovered or don't preserve in the archaeological record. And just because uh, the picture of the ox head escutcheon bowl that's on all of the promos, that um, I didn't include it in my PhD research, but that it's possible that that may have been a cremation deposit as well um, from. Uh, Fentress and Valor in Monmouthshire, um, Southeast Wales. So uh, it's quite similar to some of the um, other bucket cremations elsewhere. But anyway, for the um, partially articulated burial evidence, um, as you can see in the map and the rainbow pie chart, there are some deposits known from pretty much across the region, except for Devon, with pretty surprisingly even frequency. Um, most of these deposits have come from storage pits by quite a wide margin. Um, with a total of 27. Um, less frequently, they're found in boundary ditches, kists, graves, and even fewer from middens, um, and some various other places. Uh, the majority of partially articulated deposits are from the lower body, so a foot, a leg, maybe a tibia and a fibula, followed by, obviously, the upper body. Um, and I did come across uh, records of a few just torsos with the limbs and the head missing, so kind of gets your imagination going how that happened. Um, but, and again, biological male and female people are um, relatively evenly uh, represented. So this is where I think it gets quite interesting. So remember how there were nearly as many disarticulated deposits as there were articulated inhumations? Um, there's a whole lot of disarticulated bone from all across the Southwest, especially in Wiltshire and Somerset. And um, the biggest concentration of disarticulated bone comes from the feast midden sites. So there were some 100 disarticulated po uh, deposits from Pottern alone, uh, and this was only a very, very small portion of the midden matrix that was actually excavated. So the midden is probably full of human remains. Um, it's just that they haven't been uh, excavated yet. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's almost exclusively disarticulated human remains that come from middens. I think there may have been a partially articulated um, Juvenile from slam mice in South Wales, but there's definitely this is a definitely a place where they're choosing to place disarticulated human bone. Um, skulls are most common overall, so there's 212 deposits of skulls followed by long bones with 123, and I think this is quite interesting because it may indicate a preference for skull and skull fragments to be redeposited after whatever mortuary process led to the disarticulation. Um, and I think it's also worth considering, though, that you know a lot of the long bones are fractured and fragmented, so they aren't always immediately, again, being identified as human. You can, I'm asking everyone to double check your animal bones. <laughs> um, it may be that you know there's a lot more uh, human remains in these sites than we previously realized. But in any case, it's mostly skull and long bones, um, which may be evidence for uh, preferential selection of certain elements. Um, another thing I think is quite interesting is that there's a range of ages represented by the disarticulated bone. So it's not just adults, though they obviously make up the majority. Um, there's quite a few juvenile bones. So whatever's happening to adults post-mortem is probably also happening to the subadults to result in disarticulation. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to skip through this because it's kind of boring. Get to the good stuff. <laughs> so 
So <laughs> it's clear from the variation in skeletal completeness and articulation that there's more going on with burial in the Iron Age than what meets the eye. Um, in addition to identifying the regional patterns and anomalies and the burial characteristics, this project really focused on trying to find out as much as we can about the processes that led up to deposition. So the unseen bits that have kind of largely been left up to conjecture until this point. Um, so this is the most exciting part of the research for me because we pulled together taphonomic evidence with histological light microscopy of bone diagenesis um, to try to solve some of this wacky puzzle. And I'll explain what histological light microscopy is. It sounds really complicated, but it's not, I promise. Uh, if I can understand it, then anyone can. Um, basically, we take a very thin section of human bone. It is typically a long bone, but I also looked at crania for this because I wanted to see if perhaps heads or skulls um, were being treatedly different, or were being treated differently to the rest of the body. Um, so we have to first embed the bone in samples, um, the bone samples in epoxy resin and the hardener mix. We pop them in a desiccator vacuum, uh, and we um, then uh, slice them into um, very thin sections of bone that's usually around 60 microns thick. Sometimes I can get 30 on a good day. Uh, and what we're observing is the um, microstructure of the bone using just normal transmitted light. And the reason we tend to use long bone is because um, the microstructure is dense and consistent along the whole bone shaft. So we take kind of a transverse section, uh, like what's shown here, um, and we're looking at the osteons, which are the main building blocks of long bone. There are these little circular things here. Um, they have a central hole in them called the Haversian Canal. Uh, and these are used to um, transport nutrients through our bones during life. Um, and the structure around the Haversian Canals are made of little layers of collagen. And this is called the lamellar structure. And the little holes that you see around, um, kind of over, like oriented around the larger Haversian Canal um, are called um, osteocyte lacunae, which is where the bone cells are, typically that's where bone cells live. Um, and the little striations between them are called canaliculi. And um, like haversian canals, these transport nutrients through the microstructure, and they're kind of like little microscopic highways within, uh, within the bone. Um, now, what we're looking for when we view these thin sections is bacterial bioerosion, or the extent to which the collagen that makes up the microstructure has been eaten by bacteria. Um, different microbials have different tunneling patterns. Uh, there's currently thought to be about six different types of tunneling commonly seen in archaeological bone. The first three are bacterial, so we have budded, linear, longitudinal, and lamellate. Um, these respect the boundaries of the osteons because they're entering the microstructure through the haversian canals and the osteocyte lacunae. Um, and the idea with this is that our bodies are full of bacteria, and when we die, this causes putrefaction. Um, and the bacteria in our bodies will infiltrate our bone structure through these vascular networks, the virgin canals, um, and they'll eat the collagen in our microstructure. Uh, but there are microbials in the burial environment that can cause bioerosion. So for example, Weddell tunnels, which are these little squiggly lines that tend to relate to a kind of damp but aerated environment. And there's also cyanobacterial tunneling, um, which are slightly bigger tunnels and suggest that the bones spent some time submerged in a marine environment. There is still a whole lot that we don't know about the origins of diagenetic bacteria. Um, there are some researchers who believe that bacteria exclusively comes from the soil and not from the body. Um, we've been working with colleagues uh, at the Forensic Anthropology Center in Texas on some um, actualistic experiments. Uh, but there have also been experiments using pig carcasses in Britain that shows a strong relationship between slow decomposition in buried pigs and extensive bacterial attack, as opposed to bones that were defleshed, uh, defleshed and buried. But as I said, there's a lot that we still don't know about the, varial, the variables involved um, with bacterial bioerosion and um, microstructural preservation, which is kind of why histology is best used as a kind of as a, a, a tool in a kit, um, especially in, in connection with um, taphonomy and archaeological context. Um, and it's definitely important to note at this point that there are instances where the burial environment can completely influence histological preservation. So for instance, if a body is placed in an anaerobic environment, such as a bog, uh, this will produce 
perfect histological preservation. Um, this has been this has consistently been the case in Bronze, uh, Bronze Age mummified people, such as those at Cloud Hallen. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind too, especially when we talk about sites that we know have waterlogged environments, like Glastonbury Lake Village, for instance. Um, so with all of the ne necessary caveats in mind, we score the histological uh, preservation on a scale from zero to five. So a score of zero to one is um, considered bad preservation and might suggest that the body decomposed slowly. So this is what we would expect in the inhumation that was buried in the ground shortly after death. Um, and then a score of two to three is a middle ranging score. And this suggests that the body decomposed quickly, but not super fast. So this may be someone who was placed in a covered pit um, so that scavenging animals couldn't access it, but it was more um, aerated and uh, easier for insects to access, uh, or it may be that the burial was delayed a bit. Um, and then a score of four to five means that there's minimal bacterial attack, and this might suggest a rapid removal of tissue such as excarnation or mummification. So these two samples here illustrate the difference really clearly. Um, these are from the same site. This is from Huns Grove in Gloucestershire. Um, both of these were probably inhumations in pits. I say probably because the um, overall preservation of both of them was not very good, um, but they have vastly different histological preservation. So this one is as bad as it gets. There is absolutely no microstructure remaining, but the, you know, the one on the right is perfect. Like this is what you see exactly like, this is what a fresh cadaver looks like. So I think it's quite interesting that these two skeletons represent very different post-mortem treatment, even though they're from the same site. Uh, we also look at samples through a polarizing lens, and this is collagen biofringence. So these are the same samples as we saw on the previous slide. Um, you can see in the really well-preserved samples that the collagen is uh, arranged in little rings. It looks like they're kind of glowing, so you can see the different, the individual layers of collagen in these. Um, and then in the other sample, there's almost no collagen at all remaining, which is what you would expect when you've got bad preservation, good preservation. Um, so, but there's, uh, this is also um, important because it can, biofringence can also determine certain um, potential post-mortem or post-depositional processes. So for example, um, being exposed to heat can cause a loss of collagen, but the microstructure will look totally normal. So, um, and there's also instances of, like if there's uh, intense cycles of wetting and drying, um, that can also cause a loss of collagen biofringence, even though the microstructure would be quite well preserved. So this just gives us a bit more information um, on the environment sometimes. So in total, we, um, the project included 286 samples of human remains from 23 sites across the Southwest. Um, these samples were selected to represent variation in articulation um, and the and feature and um, uh, the type of site they came from because I was quite curious to see if, for example, uh, human remains deposited in a ditch might be treated differently to human remains that were deposited in a pit. Um, if, you know, if they had some interesting taphonomy, um, we kind of selected those as well uh, to see if we could um, find any, you know, connection between taphonomic processes and um, histological preservation. Um, we also looked at skull and long bones to see if there was any notable difference in how skulls and postcranial elements might be treated. So overall, most of the samples had very, very poor histological preservation with scores of OHI 0 to 1. And this suggests that most of the sampled remains were buried in the ground shortly after death and then backfilled so that the bodies decomposed very slowly, allowing the bacteria to kind of infiltrate and destroy the bone microstructure. Um, there are quite a few interesting outliers, though. So you'll see about one fourth of the samples that had uh, any kind, um, they, you know, they, they had something else going on with them. Um, uh, and we'll talk about these in a little bit. Um, just to highlight a few, you'll see in the um, at Glastonbury Lake Village, for instance, has pretty much the opposite pattern um, uh, that with, with most of the samples kind of having excellent histological preservation um, and the counties that, you know, the, the counties all have some variation to varying degrees except for Wales where it looks like everyone is kind of buried shortly after they die. Um, so yeah, so here are just some maps representing the variation in the histological preservation spatially. So as you can see, um, low OHI scores are pretty much evenly represented across the Southwest, but high scores are concentrated 
kind of in, again, the Somerset Wessex sort of area. Um, there's no real difference overall in the proportion of histological, histological preservation between male and female remains. They're pretty much bang on even again. So we can kind of conclude probably that male and female people aren't being treated any differently, drastically anyway, um, at least not in a way that results in differing histological preservation. So now I'm gonna go through some um, fun examples, uh, each articulation type uh, highlighting um, some interesting case studies anyway. But first, more graphs. <laughs> Um, so starting with the articulated burials, I'll be a bit brief uh, and focus on the interesting ones that kind of suggest that there might be something more complex going on. As you can see, uh, most of the articulated inhumations have poor histological preservation, which is what we would expect. Um, but there is some variation in the burials from graves, and I think that's quite interesting that they're more varied than those from pits. So these are two really interesting skeletons from different cemeteries. Uh, the the skeleton from Roe Barrow in Wiltshire was a female aged um, over 60 years old, um, buried in a tightly flexed position lying on her left side, and she was radiocarbon dated to the early Iron Age. Um, and uh, it was quite interesting because a single fragment of animal rib, probably from a sheep or goat, was placed above the skull directly parallel with the body. Um, the grave was backfilled with tightly packed flint nodules, and despite the super chalky environment, the backfill contained virtually no chalk fragments. And I think this is quite interesting because uh, it does suggest that the backfill was intentional, but you know, why this could mean that um, I guess the backfill is significant to the symbolism of the burial, or it may be that a loose, chalkless backfill was easier to move when it was time to reaccess the body. Um, also, if you look at the skull, it is turned back in an odd position. Um, it's not really in like a natural position, so it's kind of possible that the skull was manipulated after the soft tissue had been removed. And a similar thing's kind of going on possibly with this skeleton from Whitcomb in Dorset. Um, and that's quite an interesting case study for potential multi-phase burial rites and an otherwise normal looking inhumation burial. So um, the body was placed in a prone, like kind of prone in a crouch position, uh, but you can see a single uh, cervical vertebra was actually located near the pelvis. Um, but the histological preservation was really poor in this one. So uh, it would suggest that manipulation of the skull, if it, it, it would have happened some point after the, um, after skeletonization had occurred, uh, which is possibly how the vertebra got disarticulated anyway. Um, in the future, it would be kind of interesting to see if we could do histological analysis on the skull as well as the long bone to see if there was a difference in that and maybe how they were treated uh, post-mortem. Um, so the next case study uh, for articulated humations comes from Harlan Bay in Cornwall. So this is one of my favorite case studies because I think there's just some really cool, wacky stuff going on. Um, this is, again, the huge inhumation cemetery with uh, hundreds of um, kists and that was mostly excavated in the um, early 1900s. Um, and some of the bones were stained by charcoal and they were burnt. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's, there was, um, in the uh, earlier site reports, he suggested that there was fire starting kits in some of them, so um, there was evidence that perhaps these bones had been treated with some kind of heat process. Um, but uh, the problem with Harlan Bay is that they, um, the excavation wasn't as, it was, it was, it was great, but the, the, it wasn't, how they stored the human remains wasn't super thorough. Um, my dear friend and colleague Alexis Jordan at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee has been doing brilliant work on reuniting the skeletons and helping sort out context where possible. Um, but we can't, for these samples that I did, you can't really be, you can't pin them down to um, individual burials. Um, but it was, it was noted in the site report, Bullen did, does describe some kists as containing disarticulated and disembodied elements um, and suggested that these had been manipulated at some point in the, uh, in the post-mortem, post-depositional um, history of the site. Uh, there is some really interesting um, variation in the um, uh, histological preservation. So we've got a really well-preserved um, cranium here that's like super shiny. I think it may have, oh, sorry, I missed it, clicked the wrong thing. This one here is super shiny, so I think it could have been um, potentially handled, and there was some uh, suggestion that skulls were treated a bit differently at the cemetery and um, placed in like an ossuary. Again, we can't say whether this one was from the ossuary, but... Um, kind of tempting to suggest that it was because 
uh, it's in such good condition compared to some of the other ones. Um, there's also this tibia here, which has kind of got this really fractured appearance to the histological preservation, and that might suggest that uh, it had been um, treated with some kind of heat, and again, the, the biofringence is really low, so this kind of suggests that perhaps it was uh, heated. And this sample here has also got uh, this really opaque black infiltration, which may be uh, a carbon deposit from sharing a burial environment with burnt material. Um, okay, so samples taken from um, articulated skeletons and pits uh, showed very little um, histological variation, so most of them were really poorly preserved, uh, which suggests that they were kind of buried and backfilled shortly after death. Uh, so, for example, this really tightly crouched inhumation from Gus the Jaw Saints in Dorset. And the only skeleton uh, that was sampled to have near-perfect histological preservation was that one from Hunts Grove in Gloucestershire. Um, and it was a really shallow pit, so strictly speaking, it may not even be a grain storage pit. Um, but yeah, this, was, uh, this individual was definitely treated in a way that meant that their uh, histological preservation was perfect. And the tightly, super tightly crouched position suggests, I think, um, that it may have been mummified. Uh, but we don't quite know how that method of mummification um, what that what that may have been. Uh, there's also this um, pit inhumation down here that had kind of a middle ranging score. So to me, this suggests that perhaps this uh, this pit was left open um, as the person was able, so it was able to decompose a bit quicker than a normal um, inhumation that's quickly backfilled. And the interesting thing is that there's the skull of someone else in the pit um, as well. So. Uh, there's been a couple people maybe that have been buried in that pit. Partially articulated deposits. Um, the majority of these had really poor histological preservation uh, with no microstructure remaining. A few had kind of middle ranging preservation and arrested bacterial attack like this uh, deposit from Toll Puddle Ball in Dorset. So see how the bacterial attack is kind of arranged around the herversion canals here. This is um, kind of suggesting that it was kind of halted in its tracks or a change of environment or something like that. Um, so, yeah, mixed, preser mis mixed histological preservation, I think, and partially articulated uh, body parts may suggest that um, the corpses were partially exposed, again, kind of like being placed in a covered pit. Um, so disarticulated deposits, uh, I think, are kind of the more interesting ones because there's, um, they've been uh, removed from the body and deliberately placed, potentially, and they've got some really interesting taphonomy, but running a little bit out of time, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through these really boring graphs uh, and get to the good stuff. So uh, even the disarticulated remains with taphonomy that suggests that there was some post-mortem handling and manipulation had really poor histological preservation. So all of these samples here were from um, disarticulated bone from Battlesbury Bowl, and um, as you can see, this parietal fragment here has really interesting puncture marks, so I think this may have been um, from a from a canine, so from a dog. Uh, there's only a little tiny area of preserved microstructure here. Um, and the other two are also crania with no histological preservation, and both were probably worked in two shape. Well, this, this one definitely was. It was worked into this kind of rectangle shape, but um, it would have, so this suggests that it would have been removed from a skeletonized inhumation first and then, and then worked. Um, so some of the samples from Pitts did have really good histological preservation, so a single cranium fragment from Ham Hill in Somerset was perfect, which is kind of weird because all of the other like Ham Hill samples were quite badly preserved. So there is something different that's happening to this element that's not happening to the others. Um, it's possible that this individual, the person represented by this cranium fragment, was excarnated or mummified or possibly beheaded, um, but without the rest of the skeleton, we can only guess. Um, there were a few samples from Warlbury, a promontory fort in the coast of the Seven Estuary in Somerset, which have middle ranging um, preservation or arrested bacterial attack. So it could be that some of the inhumations in pits were uh, covered at Warlbury rather than quickly backfilled. Um, and okay, zipping on by. So similarly to pits, um, disarticulated bones and boundary ditches also show evidence for uh, heavy post mortem manipulation and exposure. So. Here we have a very small fragment of a long bone that was heavily chewed, probably again by a dog. Um, there's another one here, which is a, um, that's been chewed by a dog. There's 
a longitudinally split long bone with a super duper fresh fracture surface and a fractured tibia. Um, that, this one has both fresh and dry fractures. So if you looked at these, you'd think this is probably evidence for exposure or dismemberment, but the really poor histological preservation suggests um, that they were buried first. Um, oh, I'm really sad because I love this site, but I'm super out of time. <laughs> Uh, this is one of my favorite sites that I've been working on, Fishmonger Swallet. Um, it is a cave site in, Gloucest uh, in Gloucestershire, and uh, some of you may recognize this from Time Team. Um, so it was excavated by Time Team in 2000. Um, there's a, it's, you have to get to it through this really teeny tiny hole here. Um, and that's me going into the hole. Uh, but uh, ex er, the excavators, the original excavators, found um, this human crania here that was called the Murdered Maiden because um, there was uh, sharp force trauma um, on the skull, and um, we radiocarbon dated a bunch of these recently, and it was quite interesting because uh, all of them were within the um, Iron Age, so it seems, because the original story was that the Romans came and they were um, massacring people, but it seems like the Romans might be off the hook here because they're mostly, <laughs> they're mostly pre-Roman. Um, and there was this one famous long bone, this longitudinally split um, femur that uh, kind of caused a ruckus. Uh, all the press had a field day saying that this was a evidence for cannibalism. And, you know, this is all based on uh, one split fractured long bone. And that's uh, an experimental um, animal bone that's been fractured in a similar way. Because this is kind of a fracture that you see in animal bone a lot when it's um, uh, used for uh, marrow, when, it, when it's used for marrow extraction. Um, uh, so anyway, there's a lot of um, uh, folklore around the site now, I think. Um, but uh, so I was quite interested to see what the histology said about it, because if it, was a, if it truly was a person that had been cannibalized, you would expect the histological preservation to be really good. But that wasn't the case. It was actually quite bad. Um, most of the bones in the cave had poor histological preservation, but some of them did have kind of middle-ranging scores. So. But in any case, none of them were perfect, and it's um, more suggestive of uh, a maybe redeposited bones going into the cave um, from, uh, you know, if they were exposed in a pit or something, and then certain elements selected for deposition in the cave. So it's probably, it may be that they're, maybe that they're just, um, uh, well, maybe that the, we haven't yet sampled the bones, that would be evidence for excarnation, but it seems like these anyway. Um, probably not. Um, the bones from Potter and Midden. So this is probably the most interesting case study site, so I'm just going to have to zip through it because I'm really sorry because it's amazing, but talk to me about it afterwards. Um, Potter is this enormous feast midden uh, where there's, these are kind of places of community, negotiation, celebration, and fertility. They would pile rubbish up to make a monument on the landscape, and there's loads of human bone that's kind of found amongst the midden material. Uh, and a lot of them have really interesting... Uh, Tophonomy. So again, we've got these split fractured long bones that is quite similar to the one at Fishmonger Swallet. We've got a uh, frontal bone, so the, the front of a skull that's been fractured. It was quite a, a recent break and some really weird perforation thing um, that was in the corner of that one. But the preservation is really poor. So how are we, how do we make sense of, uh, of this taphonomy that suggests that they're kind of um, manipulating bones, but the histology is so poor? I mean, I think possibly they're um, as part of a more protracted mortuary practice where they're taking um, selected elements from burials, deliberately breaking them, kind of like they do with um, uh, weapons in, um, in the uh, Bronze Age and Iron Age. Again, um, there's a lot of uh, quite interesting variation of patterns. So these are all elements that had been fractured or gnawed, which kind of suggests that they were exposed or kicking around for a bit, but the preservation is mixed. So um, this might suggest that there's actually um, uh, more variation going on at Pottern, uh, or maybe different people uh, from people from different groups that have different mortuary practices being represented within the midden. Um, and these are ones that have uh, quite good preservation again. And in Glastonbury Lake Village, um, the remains are really, really well preserved. This might be because, obviously, Glastonbury Lake Village is, in a, is surrounded by peat. So if the um, bones are being deposited within the peat, we would expect them to be quite um, well preserved. 
but there was also a lot of evidence for burning on the bones. So um, it may be that these are actually people that were treated to some kind of mummification process, such as low heat burning um, or smoking, uh, meat curing kind of um, uh, mummification. And that's why we get this, this fragmentation of the microstructure, which is quite um, common uh, in, in burnt bone. Last site I'm going to talk about is just South Cadbury, uh, or Cadbury Castle, or Camelot, depending on who you ask. So this was interpreted <laughs> as a massacre site, um, which isn't really confirmed by the histological evidence, but um, there's, a, so there's a young adult male buried um, in a ditch, and there's a disarticulated leg. Uh, you can see here, so it's the whole leg, um, but the body is not there. So this is kind of, this sort of thing has been interpreted as evidence for the massacre. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not really confirmed by the histological uh, evidence, although there are some. So this sample here, um, again, is kind of someone that may have decomposed in an aerated but protected environment. Um, so they may have been uh, um, one of the elements that had been um, uh, covered by um, uh, 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 rampart collapse. Um, but it does seem like most of the samples represent inhumation shortly after death. Um, so nothing too exciting there. Okay, um, I did start trying to summarize all of this wacky variation <laughs> with words, but I thought that uh, what this presentation really needs is more graphs. Um, so um, I just made this to illustrate uh, kind of all the different possibilities, and this is a very simplified representation because there could be any combination of steps here and processes that could be repeated. Um, but clearly, Iron Age mortuary practice is very often not straightforward. Certain elements um, have been subject to many different processes and treatments. Others may be left in the ground in their original position. We obviously can't always determine the intent. So a lot of the disarticulated, uh, disarticulation and gnawing and fragmentation um, could have happened unintentionally. Uh, but a lot of it occurs so frequently and in such similar patterns that I think it suggests that these are maybe quite strictly controlled rites. Um, and uh, it's also likely that several treatments may have been afforded to the same body or the skeleton. So uh, this is a, an example um, from a burial in Hausstadt where the upper half of the body was cremated, but the bottom half remains in situ. So just to add some more complexity to the mix. Um, so in conclusion, <laughs> at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, Iron Age mortuary practices in the Southwest were varied and included often many different steps or phases. Um, excarnation likely represents a minority right rather than the majority, at least in the Southwest, um, based on evidence collected from this project. And uh, instead, it seems like primary inhumation is the most widespread mortuary right. It's just that many burial sites may be located in areas that don't tend to be targeted for archaeological excavation. Um, and some features seem to be uh, reused as burial with graves and pits being cleared out to make room for the next person. Some elements get left behind either intentionally or unintentionally, and others are collected and redeposited in other features or even taken to other sites like the Midnet Potter and a Fishmonger Swallet. Um, it's also very likely that remains were deposited in places where they will never be found, such as rivers and the sea. But all of this is to say that mortuary practice in the Iron Age uh, in Britain, um, Southwest Britain, was protracted. It was long and drawn out. People were curated and interacted with, and the remains of the dead you know, were sometimes um, passed around for probably generations. Um, multiple mortuary practices occurred simultaneously within the same site, sometimes even within the same context. It was complicated and complex, and we're really only just starting to scratch the surface of it. Um, and as is so often the case with these sorts of things, uh, it poses more questions than answers, like what factors determine who gets what kind of mortuary process. Uh, I think future work targeting um, disarticulated bone for radiocarbon dating, multi-isotope analysis, and DNA, whenever possible, will make a big stride um, in disarticulating all this beautiful chaos. And I just really look forward to hopefully working on this a bit more in the future. So um, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Many thanks to Adele for a fascinating tour of the details and histological bits and how the bacteria decompose bones. Yeah, it's yeah. And then how people are varied. Oh, imagine well. that. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs>
Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's maddening, but it's amazing. So yeah, yeah. I've been I'm very lucky to work on this project. Thank you very much for oh, delivering so much. the twenty third Sarah Champion lecture. And to those of you watching online, hello. Mm -hmm. And now, sadly, you're away and you cannot share the wine. But there is a bonus <laughs> to being here in the room in person. Um, and so, thank you very much. And please join us now in thanking Adele and then moving into the room across the way where there is wine laid out. And we've got about an hour to ask Adele more questions if you would like to meet some of the undergraduate dissertation prize winners, to talk to the people who delivered the Stonehenge exhibition. What a cracking way to end the evening. Thank you very much. Then. Thank you. Thank you.